So good afternoon, everyone, and uh, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, you'll notice from my accent, I'm from the same part of the world as Chris. So um, hopefully, you get your ears used to it, so you'll uh, that you'll be able to understand me. Um, one of the things that we have in common, Renew International. How many of you have done a Renew Small Group sometime in your life? Yeah, many, many of you. Wonderful. Uh, you know that we're founded in the Archdiocese of Newark. So we have a very important person in common. So the day that you were all cheering, we were weeping and gnashing our teeth <laughs> when you stole, no, the Holy Spirit <laughs> called Archbishop Hefter here. And when I, had, when I saw him afterwards at the installation of Cardinal Tobin, I said, oh, I said, we really were disappointed when you weren't, didn't become Archbishop here in Newark. And he, he looked, he said, are you kidding me? You got an upgrade. So, <laughs> but I honestly think we both won in the process. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, Chris spoke a lot about this sense of how do we, in innovative ways, how do we grow the church? And particularly in terms of through the avenue of leadership. So I'll be touching on some of those points. I'll also talk about how we grow in this sense of communion or communio. Our relationship, our communion with Christ, with our brothers and sisters in our parishes, and then most importantly, as Pope Francis calls us, to be in communion with those on the periphery. And I will speak specifically uh, through the vehicle of small Christian communities. Now we call them different names here in the States, small faith sharing groups, um, small groups, small Christian communities, but it seems kind of a general why I've chosen this word small group ministry. It seems to be kind of a universal, particularly in our U.S. context in both the Protestant and Catholic Church, to speak about uh, small communities or small group ministry. What's interesting is we're talking about growing the church, growing our parishes, growing young. And what small communities do is, in fact, ask us to grow small. That it's through growing small and connecting people in a deeper way, in communion with God and one another, that we, in fact, grow our parishes, grow our, our church. One of the things that, as I've been uh, creating new things that renew, visiting people that really have best practices with small communities, I'm always learning something new. And there's something that really touched me from the Gallup research, and let, let me, that has transformed my thinking, particularly in the last year or so. I would, was thinking, like I'm sure many of you, that somehow if people, we can get people to the parish, come to Mass on Sunday, that that leads to uh, believing, leads to belonging. But what Gallup says from their research, that belonging leads to believing. Now think about that. That insight has really changed, talk about a transformative way of changing even our culture at Renew, belonging leads to believing. So when people are engaged in, whether it be uh, thinking about young people, when they go on um, some kind of trip to help the poor, that they might not articulate their faith, but because of that experience of belonging, of, of doing something that's bigger than themselves, it then can lead, or and in fact many times does lead, to this deeper faith and belief. So I think it, something important when you're talking about why would you be doing small communities, belonging leads to believing. So it might change when you're thinking about doing certain things in your parish, if you could think about that, belonging leads to believing. So the more we can engage people in relationship, one-on-one, -on -one, in group, that in fact will then call people to a deeper faith. So 
I'll be talking about the sense of the parish as a community of communities, some key principles that might help you in a very strategic or um, concrete way to grow small groups. But I think what's important is to begin with why small communities. And the panel that we'll have that I'll be facilitating, that's the first question I'll ask them. Why did you start small groups and what's the impact? What's the concrete impact on your community since you have been intentional about growing small groups? So why put the time, the planning, and your resources into launching and growing small communities? So let's look at the recent research. Many of you probably have heard of, well some of you, Parish Catalyst, and there's a book that Bill Simon recently wrote. It says, it's called Great Catholic Parishes. And what the book's about is they did research on the top, well the ones, it's not that they're the only great parishes, but parishes that were really thriving, and then to discover what's their best practices. So that's what the book's about. And in that book, the study found that 61.5% of great Catholic parishes who were interviewed as part of this study have an active small group ministry. And they were clear of why they began small groups or continue to grow them. To awaken faith, you know, it's an evangelizing, deepen faith, so people would come to a greater knowledge of faith. And that, I think what's most important is that people would take their faith into everyday life, act on their faith, just works and charitable acts, that they would see that that was part and parcel of what it means to be a Catholic uh, Christian. So this whole sense of growing small groups for the purpose of making missionary disciples. And as Chris said, women and men who are both followers of Jesus Christ and who are leaders being sent out to share the gospel with others. You can have the greatest parish, the greatest homilies, music, but the church that most people are going to meet is you and me. So that one-on-one -on -one sharing the faith, that sense of being sent out to our workplaces, our families, our communities to be the messengers of God's grace and good news. Another study that talks about small groups or small communities is the Gallup research on congregational engagement. And for, according to Gallup, 43% of people who belong to some kind of parish small group are highly engaged in the life of their parish. It's more than double than those who don't belong to a small group. And what's more, what more, those who belong to small communities score significantly higher on any and all of the different engagement indicators in the Gallup study, in the Gallup research. So Gallup Parish Engagement Study reveals that small groups enable people to form strong personal relationships, and those who've been in small communities can testify to that, to address their spiritual needs. So I'm thinking about that 71% who've left the church and identify that as they didn't feel any growth. I've heard many people, we've done different surveys at Renew, and many people will say, you'll hear it, I am not being fed. And sometimes they'll go to another parish so you've all, some of you have done that. <laughs> I've done that. But others will go to another congregation, another tradition. And I find this more in younger people because they don't have that sense of belonging. So no matter how turned off we might be, it'd be really hard to be part of another church tradition, at least for me. I mean, impossible. You know, it's like being Catholics in the marrow of my bones, you know? But that's not true of this current generation. So when the door is slammed on them, if when they come to baptize their baby, they're pushed away, or they've got 34 obstacles, they just go down the street. And you know what? A lot of my friends who would say to me, you know, Terry, 
at least the baby's being baptized somewhere. My poor mother would drop dead in her grave, you know? <laughs> but it's a different time, isn't it? It's a different time. And it challenges us, you know, uh, the burning platform that Chris talks about. We can't be complacent. We have to be proactive in inviting and welcoming. And I think particularly with young people, empathy, you know, hearing from their side of the story. So small groups, being part of a small group, help people to address their spiritual needs, to learn and grow, to feel others care about them. This is all part of the study and have a greater sense of mission. From a study that Cara did on Renew, Renew Small Groups a number of years ago, participants, and this was from, Gallup is not just Catholic, so they're kind of across the board, but of course ours at Renew were 99% Catholic. People talked about a, a greater awareness of God, a commitment to the Catholic Church, attending Mass more frequently and more attentively, integrating faith in daily life, all the kind, feeling a greater sense of belonging in the parish. So these studies show that small communities are an expression of ecclesial communion. You know, people are looking for that kind of personal encounter with Christ. So that communion we have with Jesus is strengthened. A greater communion with others. So what happens, you know, we've, we're so connected, and what are people saying in a work time that we're so connected by our smartphones that people are feeling even more disconnected. It's interesting. So these kind of, uh, these groups have that kind of intimacy that, that we find. Um, I remember uh, often I've heard of this, that people are saying before I was part of a small group, if I didn't go to Mass because I was sick or no one would notice, no one would notice. But now because I'm part of this community of communities, people say, oh, how come you weren't there? Well, we missed you at the group on Thursday night. So again, this sense of you have a name and you're connected and if you're not present, it matters. So small groups have the potential to be engines for missionary discipleship. And I'll talk later about the importance of these groups being both gathered and sent. So they're more than support groups or a book club, even though there's a lot of elements in a, some of you are part of book clubs and they're good and they get a good sense of community. But they're, when we're talking about small Christian communities in the church, it's both, we're both gathered and sent, that sense of missio and sharing that communion, not only with that group, but certainly our gifts with the larger community and even the community beyond. You know, I give a lot of talks on evangelization and when you ask someone, a pastor or someone on the staff, you'll say, you know, what, how big is your parish? And they'll say, oh, we have 600 families or 1,200 families. The truth is, that you have a lot more than that because the parish canonically is the full boundaries of your neighborhood. And whether they're Catholic or not Catholic, whether they're poor or they're rich, whether they're disengaged or engaged. So that sense that to be missionary disciples, everything we talked about this morning in terms of going out to the peripheries and doing all we can to both nourish inside and outside. This sense of communio, and I know this is your, the first mark of the church, is, is community. And I would say small communities to be at their fullest potential have, just like any microcosm of the church, needs to have all four marks of the church. But certainly the one that's most known for is this sense of communion um, and sense of belonging. So according to to now St. John Paul II, in his document, Church in America, he talks about small communities as the source of bringing new life into parishes and deepening all levels of communion. So he writes in Church in America, one way of renewing parishes might be to consider the parish as a community of communities. It seems timely, therefore, 
to form ecclesial communities and groups of a size that allows for true human relationship, that fosters both odd intra, you know, the inner support and the, our, our spiritual life, but also to have this communion with parish communities to which such groups belong and with the whole diocesan as well as the universal church. So this sense that growing the church small, a church that's more connected, a more mission oriented, actually causes the reverse to happen to the church, the parish, the, on the dia local, diocesan, and universal level, level to grow in, in many different ways. He also talks about uh, St. John Paul II, about small groups give people an opportunity, and, and I quote, to gather the heed of the word of God, to reflect on the range of human problems in light of this word, and gradually to make decisions inspired by the all-embracing love of God. So again, we gather together to reflect on the word or a teaching of the church, to connect it to our everyday lives so that we can make decisions that affect our families in the workplace or wherever we might find ourselves. So yes, it's good to feel support, but it's more than that, so that we can live out our Christian faith. Um, a number of years ago, Gallup did another study on this whole sense of connecting our faith with everyday life. And th what the research found that people were asked whether you're, this is again not just Catholic, if you go to, when you go to church on Sunday, how much effect does that have on the other six days of the week? It was something like 7% of the people said that had any effect on their everyday life. And they actually listed things like pilfering at work or the way you treat your spouse, um, kind of these everyday, uh, if you cut people off, you know, <laughs> on the road, whatever it might be, these everyday ways good ethical business decisions. People saw very little connection from Sunday to their everyday life. But when we come together in these smaller groups, there's an accountability that we look at our lives, certainly in the light of the word, but in this small community that challenges us uh, to act. So I'd like to share some of my experience both from being a um, pastoral minister. I, I had ministered about 12 years in the, in the Bronx, in a multicultural parish, in fact, uh, in a couple of parishes. And so we had small groups there. We actually had Renew there and Forced to those groups, groups in both Spanish and uh, English. And then for my 15 years of traveling throughout the United States, but even internationally, observing and, and trying to assist parishes in building uh, small communities. So I've come up with six principles. The first one, write down the vision, define the purpose, choose, empower, and form leaders. Fourth, develop a strategy. Fifth, offer options and provide solid contact. Tenth, and grow your small group ministry. And again, when you grow the small group ministry, you grow your parish. So first, write down the vision. So in the book of Habakkuk, chapter two, verse two, the prophet, the Lord tells the prophet, write down the vision and make it plain upon the tablets. It's simple, no leadership, no, sense, no vision, equals a parish at its best in maintenance mode. And I think in our time, it means a parish in, parish in diminishment. I think for all the, the reasons that Chris talked about this morning, we're in a different place. Before we could ride a little bit, people were still coming to us. That is no longer true. We need a new vision. And then of course, innovative strategies to live out that vision today. So a vision sets a pastoral direction in a particular local context. So a Pose vision may be, and then depending on your parish, how you might state this, but the parish as a dynamic community of communities. 
you know, bringing in all the diversity, whether that be ethnic diversity, whether that be ecclesiologies, the way people understand different types of liturgy and music. So how do we hold that all in this parish model that's here comes everybody? So this sense of a parish as a dynamic communion or, com or community of communities. In such a vision and structure, parishioners gather in small groups determined by neighborhood, language, affinity, availability, interests, or common ministry or mission. They do this in order to pray, to get support from one another, to live out fully the Christian life, and then to act on the gospel mandate to love God and our neighbor in a very concrete way in people's very particular uh, life situations. This vision of parish is not about a parish with small groups, but a parish as a community of small communities. The second principle, define the purpose. Small groups or small Christian communities are about making disciples. So again, it's more than a support group. At the heart of it is giving people the space to encounter Christ anew, a place that they have the space to share faith, practice that in a sense, and then go forth out in mission, both gathered and sent. In Pope Francis' recent exhortation on holiness, he refers to the need for both contemplation and action. For small community be, communities to be schools of holiness and discipleship, they need not only have a mission, but more importantly, understand themselves as on a mission. When I first came in and I saw the vision or the mission statement of the parish here, that's exactly what they, they say. It was great. We were a parish on a mission on a mission, moving forward, being sent. The third principle that we talked a lot about this morning, choose, empower, and form leaders. The most effective form of small group ministry is supported by the pastor and the staff and has a person dedicated to nurturing and growing those small communities. And in my experience, the most important thing that that person can do, I think in terms of the pastor and the staff and the parish council, to have the vision and connect what's happening in those small communities to that vision. But very, very important is whoever that leader is to support the leaders or facilitators of those small communities. Gather them together afford them opportunities to grow, recognition. A lot of the uh, Gallup work on strength finders is, yes, identifying people's gifts, but also then affirming that and raising people up. So a good practice is once a year to bless those leaders and to send them uh, forth. The other thing is that to, so they're not just another group in the parish. They have to be integrated into the leadership, whether it be uh, the staff leadership, and certainly also if there's a parish council, that sense of what's the purpose of these groups and how do we continue to grow them. And what I have found, uh, it, there are places that leaders can arise from, new leaders. So when you get new people involved, what I think is really helpful, and we do this in our training with Renew, is for the leader is trained, and then they invite somebody from the group, could you lead prayer? And help that person if they've never done it before. So it's much easier to ask somebody to do that in a group of eight or 12 people that now they've grown comfortable with than to say, could you lead the prayer at the parish barbecue or um, at a prayer service that we're having? So it becomes an opportunity to raise up leaders or to say, maybe you could lead this week. But again, 
to help people, give them the skills that they need and the training so they can start in the small group and then be able to bring that to the larger parish community. So it's a place that could, is also a school of, of leadership. Paying attention to that and raising people up. And that's why it's important to gather those small group leaders together so they can talk about the people in their group and what might be, what are some needs in the parish and gather those folks and invite them to participate more in the different activities of the, of the parish and take some uh, leadership there. When we worked um, recently in the Archdiocese of Boston, so many of the parishes gave testimony to that after being, we have this program called Arise Together in Christ that helps to launch small groups, and they were saying we have so many more catechists, we have so many more people willing to bring a communion to the homebound, more people helping with our homeless ministry. So it, again, to be able always to be talent scouts, looking for people's gifts and inviting them, and I think we said this earlier, one-on-one. -on -one. Putting something in the bulletin is not a way to encourage people to take up a leadership, particularly if they haven't done it before. Uh, a, a priest friend of mine, I don't know if it's true, but he told me that uh, a priest friend of his, he was discouraged because nobody was reading the, or he didn't think anybody was reading the bulletin. So on the bottom, he just wrote a little note and said, I'll see you in a couple of weeks, I'm getting married and I'm moving to somewhere else. <laughs> and he said, no one said a word except, <laughs> he came back and they said, Father, how was your vacation? You know, so, <laughs> so I, there's probably some truth to that. So it's even, you know, I hear over and over again when we do these trains, people say, I wish Father would say it from the pulpit. And I, I think it is important to invite people to things from the pulpit, but honestly, it's that one-on-one -on -one and saying, look, we see you have a great voice and a gift maybe you'd like to read on Sundays. Or you have a great gift with young people. Can you help us out with this particular program or whatever it might be? So again, this sense of choosing, empowering, and forming leaders. The other thing that I, I, that I have been a fruit of, of our small groups with Renew is people, many would say, before I was part of the small group, I, I couldn't really, I didn't feel comfortable sharing my faith. I couldn't articulate it. So I'd be at work and somebody from an evangelical church is kind of, you know, asking me, am I saved or am I born again? And I didn't know what to say to them, you know. Um, or I, I could not say, well, this is what my faith means to me. But being able to do that in a group of eight to 12 people, it's actually practice so that we feel comfortable when we're asked questions or we feel led by the Holy Spirit to share our faith with our grandchild, with our neighbor who is hurting, um, that we're able to do that. I'd say even spontaneous prayer. That, that practice of praying together makes it a lot easier when you're at a friend's house and I always say, instead of saying, and I know I have an advantage being a sister, but you know, people say, sister, will you pray for me? You know what I say now? Would you like me to pray right now for you? Let's pray. And then people say, well, I don't know about that. But, <laughs> but my experience is people are open to that. You know? So I think that that's another very positive uh, way that people get formed to be leaders, to be proactive in that sense of being uh, missionary disciples. Fourth, I would say to develop a strategy. And we talked about, Chris said, the whole sense of changing the culture. So I think that's that thing about one thing to change the culture is to really think about belonging leads to believing. <laughs> that small can grow our church. So when you have that vision of the parish as a community of communities, communities that already exist, whether it be Alta Rosary Society or the Knights of Columbus, how do you get them to um, pray together and share faith? And then the parish council, the finance council, to see themselves as a community of faith that from their faith and belief go out. And then, of course, the intentional uh, communities that we gather. 
So this is our, our work at Renew to help parishes launch small Christian communities. Something like 70% of all small communities in the U.S. started from a Renew process. The challenge has been for us is that people think of us as a program. And if you think of it as a program, you think of a beginning and an end. And actually, the vision from our founders 40 years ago was this sense that these communities or seasonal groups would become ongoing small Christian communities. So we're doing a lot of work to try to help people to see this is more about more like a process that helps these small communities get launched and then give the people the tools to be able to to grow them. Um, and I would say a, another part of a strategy is, okay, so now you have these small groups, so you launch them and you use some kind of process to do that. But even in that, we've had uh, it renew some, we say, okay, make a plan. They say, we want a seekers group. So we have a couple of people that are seasoned and then let's invite people that are not connected to the church. The only way you get those people is people personally invite them. Or a young uh, person's small group. So to be intentional, uh, there's, a pa there's a parish in Scranton, Pennsylvania that we've been working with, and they've targeted religious ed parents. So to form small groups with them at the same time that they're waiting for their children, instead of, you know, going for coffee at Starbucks, you know, get them good coffee, you know, and create a space for them and a, a good facilitator and have them, whether it's 30 minutes or 45 minutes, have some kind of uh, prayer and support together. So again, um, to be intentional. Offer options and provide solid content. So offer a variety of days and times and locations and I think this is what we've, why we've been so successful at Renew because when you do you know this, adult faith formation at 8 o'clock or 7.30 on a Wednesday night, people work at night. Other times people are tired or whatever it might be. So if you can have right after mass, because some people don't like to drive at night, um, on a Friday night, uh, we've had a lot of young adult groups meet on a Sunday at 10 o'clock uh, on campuses. So wherever it might be, a variety of, of times and places and also a variety of small groups. So whether they be seasonal small groups, uh, my experience is the best way to launch is what we've learned at Renew, do six weeks. Yes, people, not for a commitment for the rest of their life, but can you commit yourself for six weeks? And then you go to the next season, can you commit yourself for another six? And then give people options to be part of something that's more ongoing. So many parishes follow up a renew process with seasonal groups of Lent and Advent. Others form ministerial small groups that, again, they use that method of see, judge, act, where are we at in our life, let's look at that in terms of the scripture, and then go forth and act. I'll give you a quick example. One of the uh, women, I'm in a Tuesday night golf league, and it's amazing. I've done more evangelizing there. <laughs> and at the beginning, they didn't want to play with me because they figured that they couldn't curse, you know. <laughs> so we got over that. But anyway, <laughs> so this woman, Catherine, says to me, you know, I just want to share this with you. And uh, we're having a burger and a glass of wine. And she tells me that the choir director every week when they meet and have an excellent choir, that he prepares the readings, gives a little reflection that they all share together, and their mission is to sing and give that message of the gospel on that Sunday. And she said it's been such a powerful experience for her. And she said, I think that's what you're trying to get at, at Renew. I said, absolutely. So it's, to me, it's a ministerial uh, small community. So it's another small group. And then small Christian communities, I would identify as those who are ongoing, whether weekly. Um, they say for the group to really be solid that you have to at least meet monthly. And many of those we have that follow up for a new process are lectionary based. Some of them use uh, 
the social teaching of the church. We have a book on uh, Laudato Si called Care of Creation. So there's, people can do things topically, uh, but I think it's the sense that the group commits themselves and moves forward. But to me, that's after that you actually launch them and grow them, and then people, as their leadership grows, can use other kinds of materials and develop more, I would say, affinity groups. The other thing is to use uh, mission-directed face-sharing resources. And what I mean by this, what we do at Renew, we all, it's not always called this, but we always try that pattern of see, judge, act. So again, sometimes when you just read a book, which is good, but if there's not prayer involved, if there's not some faith sharing, and I think most importantly, that sense of mission, that act, that's what makes these groups places where missionary disciples uh, can be formed. So that sense of, of moving out into the community, living out our baptismal call to be leaders and promoters of the gospel, not only inside the parish, probably less inside and more outside, because we're the ones that are out there with and among people, and particularly people who are disengaged from the church. So the best way to engage people again is that one-on-one -on -one kind of humble um, sharing of who we are. Grow your small group ministry. So again, this sense of that we are gathered and sent. And we can't be satisfied that we still have 80 people in the small groups or that they're dwindling. How do we grow those groups? And I think an important way to do that is to continually talk to those who are in the groups about what it means to be a missionary disciple. And as Chris said earlier, ask them how to think in innovative ways to invite those who might be disenfranchised. So again, maybe after you got going for a while, you have a seeker group and somebody has a particular gift with people who are unchurched or some way uh, have been disenfranchised. So to help them to start those, those groups. I don't know if you can see this picture, but when we started the small groups in the Archdiocese of Boston, they had a um, nursing home there and this woman, they all got a rise t-shirts I think maybe those are the white Catholic ones. But anyway, she came to the training. So she's a member of that community there, assisted living, and she started a small group right there at the uh, assisted living facility. We have a, a, another group that went to, uh, there was a two family house and both homebound. So two of the women met with them weekly for prayer and sharing to form their own small Christian community because it was difficult for them to get out. So these are all innovative things that, simple things. The other one is there was a parade in the local town, I think that's in Indiana, and the people made a float <laughs> and with their parish on it and promoting small uh, groups and actually did sign up uh, when the flo float kind of became still. So simple kind of innovative ways to to grow your small group ministry. For me, the most important thing, there's no silver bullet to parish revitalization, but we need to do something. And I think that small groups and growing them is a concrete, doable way, whether you start with three of them or four of them or five of them, to begin to engage people in a deeper way and call them to that full baptismal call for each of us to be missionary disciples and live our lives influenced uh, by the gospel. So we're going to just take a moment um, of quiet and then I'm going to invite our, the panel up to talk about some concrete ways that, that they are living out this call to the, their powers to be a community of small communities. So I just want you to take a minute and maybe just talk, take a moment of quiet and think of one thing that struck you, one thing that struck you that maybe connected into an experience when you were in a small group, maybe you are in one now, or maybe something that would be helpful 
um, in your own uh, parishes. So just take a minute of quiet and then I'm just going to ask you to talk to the person next to you. So what I'll be, what we'll be looking for from our panelists is some best practices. Some best practices of developing and growing uh, small communities and forming missionary disciples. So each one of them comes from a different context. Um, Viviana will talk about growing them from um, the cells, right, the cell theory, and alloys from Eastern Africa, uh, talking about growing small, young people, small communities, and Samantha from doing a renew process called Be My Witness, how that's helping them to develop and grow uh, small communities. So um, I'm going to ask each one of them just to say their name, their context, and why small communities, you know, and what's the impact? We'll start that way. So good afternoon. My name is Viviana Sotro, and I am the mission director at St. Stephen's Church in South Minneapolis. And our church in 2008 had about 150 parishioners, and Father Joseph Williams was assigned as a pastor of that church, and the church was facing the possibility of closure. So with a mission statement of opening wide the doors to Christ, Father Joseph initiated two missionary acts, street evangelization and small groups called cells. So he sent out missionaries to go on the streets, to encounter the lost ship, to meet our neighbors, to know about their needs, and also to be able to respond to those needs. And he also implemented small groups called cells where new parishioners and current parishioners will meet every week and they were being fed in those groups. So these cells have been happening in our church for about 10 years now and the church has grown from 150 to 1400 parishioners that worship at St. Stephen's every Sunday. And And uh, the cells began with 12 leaders. Now we have 38 leaders leading these small groups. Uh, but what had helped a lot in our church, the cells, is to grow the church. Surprisingly, our numbers grew not much because of the street evangelization, but because of the small groups. People attending a small groups are being cared by the leader of that small group, a leader that has spent time to get to know them personally, to know what they are struggling with, what are their needs, and to help them walk the walk. So when they are being fed in that way, they can encounter Christ, and then they are on fire. So naturally, they go out, they go back to their relatives, to their workplaces, to their neighbors, and they invite them to receive what they have received in that small group. So that's why Father Joseph began cells 10 years ago in our parish, because the parish was about to be closed. And we are so thankful to the Holy Spirit for guiding us in this mission that happened with the grace of God. Great, thank you. I'm gonna give you a, I'm gonna give you a sign. My name is Alois Nyakundi. I come from Kenya, which is in the Eastern Africa, part of Africa. So I have a ministry called Young People, Small Christian Communities. And all of us, we have been talking about young people, why young people don't come to church. Everybody's worried. So sister asked me to talk about the reason why I started my ministry of Young People, Small Christian Communities. One is because everybody's worried about young people. All of us, we are worried here today. The second thing, we go back to the Bible, the first small Christian community. That's the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Then we talk about the disciples. So it tells us the importance of having a relationship because God knew that he could not work alone. He needed some people to help him. That's why we have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Then so I started this ministry of young people, small Christian communities, because you realize like in Eastern Africa, all, all over the world, 
you find young people are trying to look for, to belong somewhere. They are looking for somewhere to be. And when they come to church, they find that the church is full of rules, full of teachings. You tell young people, you find pastors, all church leaders telling young people, don't do this, don't do this. You don't give them a, a listening session. What Pope Francis says, uh, let's listen to young people. Let's go out and look for young people from wherever they are. If they are in, in the clubs drinking, go there and evangelize to the young people. So I started this ministry because young people were complaining, they were saying the church is too dull, the church is full of teachings. We need at least somebody to listen to us. So I started this small group so that we can give forum to young people at least to listen to one another and to advise one another. So my ministry, we encourage young people to meet weekly and share the gospel of the coming Sunday. And not only sharing the gospel of the coming Sunday and connect it to the challenges they are going through in their lives. The challenges, they try to find answers through what God speaking to them through the gospel of the coming Sunday. Thank you so much. I'm Samantha Hagel. I'm the Director of Mission at St. Mary of the Lake in White Bear Lake. I'm here with my colleagues today. And about, let's see, um, 2016, our parish leadership said, we have got a vibrant community, we've got lots of outreach ministries, and at the same time, we know that we want to be a mission-focused parish. So they undertook the um, task of entering in with Be My Witness and doing a, a parish-wide assessment. And from that assessment came some really concrete, strong tools, ideas, things we could do to become a mission-focused parish. So then, in Lent of this year, during the beginning of Lent of this year, we, we kicked off phase two, which was the Be My Witness small faith sharing groups. We um, have a parish of about 2,000 families. We enjoy having 1,500 or so parishioners every weekend. And uh, our goal was to have, you know, maybe 100 or so people based on what we've had in, in past Lenten efforts. We ended up with 240 parishioners and 26 small faith sharing groups, which uh, was really wonderful. I'll look forward to sharing more about that. But thank you for, for all of you all being here. Great. Good news. So I shared with the panel some of the, the way I articulate these principles of uh, best practices of growing, launching and growing. So they've chosen two principles each, some of them the same principle, which is fine, and they'll talk about that, how they have uh, really worked those principles and then the fruits of that. So why don't we mix it up a little bit? Do you, would you like to start? Yeah, right away. He, yep. <laughs> so Alois, you, you, you got it. So I talked about my ministry that's young people, small Christian communities. And so in Africa, I started my ministry about four years ago. So, so far so good, we have about a thousand young people, small Christian communities. That's small, Christian commu com small communities for young people. And so the plan we are having, uh, we are having a plan that every parish, every high school, every university should have young people, small Christian communities. Because we have realized that they are very important and it's one way of connecting young people back to the church. And it's one way of pastors, uh, it's one way of, uh, which can help the pastors get the information from young people, even that the church leaders, so that they can be able to know the challenges these young people are going through. And at the same time, you realize like, you know, young people need, they have a lot of energy. Apart from coming for mass, they need something else. So in these young people, small Christian communities, they help these young people to identify different activities which brings them together. For example, food is very important with young people. So if you want to bring young people together, you have to have a lot of food. Yesterday when I came to my friends' houses, I told them, I'm hungry, I need food. So this food is very important. And that is the research we did, and we realized that food brings young people together. So I want to talk about uh, strategy, and maybe talk about the vision later. So the strategy we have laid uh, I have a team which is called Reigniters of Young People, Small Christian Communities. And basically what we do, we move to different parishes in Eastern Africa, that's nine countries. We, uh, we 
to conduct workshops and try to set up young people, small Christian communities in different parishes, dioceses, high schools, and in universities. So we are, we are trying to establish uh, training teams in every diocese so that they can help us. You know, it's overwhelming for one team to move all over Eastern Africa. Then the next thing which we have tried to lay a strategy is to have listening sessions, which I said they are very important. Pope Francis is encouraging us to go out and listen to young people we don't go to teach them, or we don't go to tell them that do this. We just go to listen to young people. That's what Pope Francis is saying. So we are trying to listen to young people. So before we tell them that this is what you need to do in your young people, small Christian communities, first we listen to the challenges they are going through, what they want, before we see how we can incorporate that in our ministry. Then the next thing we are doing is the use of social media. And that's what Pope Francis is saying. Either you go digital or die. That's what Pope Francis is saying. And if you can see, for example, you know, you cannot find young people on Sunday outside the church. You know, you find everybody has already gone. But if you go to Facebook, WhatsApp, you see already young people are online. They are communicating a lot. They are saying, today this is how mass was, this is what I did not like. So Pope Francis is encouraging us to go out and reach young people through social media. You don't go out to tell your children that, oh, I don't want you to have phones. Encourage them to have phone, but uh, help them to use this phone in a positive way, for example, sharing the gospel, uh, connecting with one another, uh, encouraging one another. That's what Pope Francis is trying to tell us. And so in my ministry also, we are trying to use social media to reach the young people. For example, we have small Christian communities, which we call online small Christian communities for the young people who cannot be able to meet, maybe they are on work or they stay far from one another. So they are able to pick, sorry, they are able to connect to one another through the social media. Thank you so much. You know, having this conversation with Alloys, um, I guess a week ago or two weeks, and I was just so struck by you know, Africa being a totally different context, and the church in Africa is young, much younger than here in the U.S., but some of the same challenges in terms of young people. So I thought that those two principles we can carry over in our context. First, the listening, right, starting with listening for what they need, and that uh, Allies was very clear with me that the leaders are young persons. You know, they are the leaders in the small groups. They are kind of uh, working with him to, uh, to grow the small groups. And then, of course, using social media as a method of evangelization. So um, I think that we can absolutely take in our context uh, these very important ways to reach young persons. So maybe we'll go to Samantha next. Um, I'll speak to vision and, and one strategy that we used. Um, our vision uh, developed or came out of our phase one planning. And so that vision was really linked to our mission overall, but our vision um, was to form disciples or is to form disciples who uh, know, follow, and share Jesus. So it seems pretty simple. Um, and there are real concrete ways we knew that we could go about, about undertaking this work. And one of them we landed on was the Be My Witness um, small faith sharing groups. We knew that was an important component, and yet we hadn't done that before. As I mentioned, we have a, a very welcoming community, but I don't know if it's just Catholics or just our community, but it's hard to talk about sharing your faith. It's hard to, to talk about it. And so as we began to think about how we were going to sell this initiative, you know, how are we going to think about uh, getting everybody involved in this? Um, one really awesome decision we made, and this goes to strategy, is training leaders. And we started that early with what we called our invitation team. So our invitation team started making plans for how we were going to sign people up and roll out this small faith sharing group initiative. And they planned that for seven months before we even got there. So all of that planning and all of their big dreams, they were preparing leaders to lead the small faith sharing groups and they were uh, preparing our parish, our leadership and our priest to you know, be 
be ready to start talking about this. They had a, a map and a plan and it was awesome. They also, um, you know, went all in, like, you know, go, go for it. You might as well go for it. So they invited Archbishop Hebda to come and he came. So he came and commissioned people and then helped us kick off our, our first weekend of signups. So when we talk about strategy and a couple of other real concrete things, uh, what we learned, I think, is, um, you know, don't give up. Go ahead and just go all in. Go all in and set some big goals. We set a goal of 203 people. It was a very random number. Like I said, we got 240 that signed up. And then we also have, um, we decided that our young people may not really, it may not be the same to do a Be My Witness group with them. So we did have a youth Lenten series for them and we had 123 that came through. And that was just um, wonderful. And again, Archbishop Hebda, we invited him to come for pizza. What? No, we had Donatelli's that night. Food, back to food. And, and you know, everybody came. So, you know, never underestimate the power of food with your young people. Um, and so, right. And so, um, let me see what else we have here. Um, oh, bulletins and faith stories. We started those early so that people would start to get the idea of what we were talking about. But at the same time, that was a little bit um, overwhelming for some. They had the idea that by the time that they got through a small faith sharing community, it must mean that they were going to share their faith in front of everybody at church. So we had to, had to explain that, no, that really isn't what it's about. It's about, you know, being in a community and hearing from each other and, and boosting each other up. Um, so I would say a couple of numbers, because I'm a number, a number geek. We had... Um, like I said, 240, and that represents about 16% of our parish. So as I said, on a weekend, we have about 1,500 people, and now our challenge is to think about, okay, the rest of those people, what are, what are we gonna do to engage them? Um, the successes that we've seen from the early group um, formations are, are concrete. I'll share one quick story. Um, Diane is somebody who um, joined a small faith sharing group, and she had never done anything like that. She's what she called a cradle Catholic, and so she felt like she knew her faith. But being in a small faith sharing group, she said, has really changed her outlook. She um, realizes that she's not alone in this journey and that everybody's struggling with their faith every day. And so what does it mean to have the support of others? You know, it means a lot. And so she, it was just great to hear all of these wonderful um, little stories from people. Um, so it's been a good experience. and. Happy to hear more. Yeah. Okay. So we'll have Viviana share, and then we might have a chance for a couple of questions um, for the last five minutes or so. But you're on. So I'll talk about principle number three, choosing and forming the, uh, the leaders of this small group. So we know that small groups don't make disciples. The leaders of the small groups are the ones who make disciples. So we spend a lot of time discerning about the gift from our parishioners that can be leaders. And we also work together, our leadership team from the church work together with the leaders of the small groups because they are the ones that know very well each of the members in the group. So they know what talents each one of them have. And some of them, you know, have charisms to be group leaders, some others don't, and they can be serving in different ministries. So every year, this is going to happen uh, actually this Sunday in our church, every year at the end of the formation, faith years, faith, uh, year of faith, we uh, commission our new servers. So we've been discerning for about three, four months who are those that will be the next leaders of the small groups, who are those that are going to be the lectors, the ushers, the Eucharistic ministries. So uh, at this Sunday mass, the new leaders will be commissioned. And another important thing that our pastor is doing, he spends a lot of time forming leaders. He meets with them twice a month for formation, praying with them, and listen to the Holy Spirit and when the, where the Holy Spirit wants to guide us. So investing time in those leaders has also helped our church to be able to provide more, more pastoral care that our priest on his own you know, he can do everything. So these leaders being formed by the priest can do much more than just one person can do. I also, I would like to, to refer briefly about the six principles growing the small groups. 
So we use uh, um, the cells evangelizing parishes, and it's a system of evangelization that uh, talks about growing. So uh, those that join a cell know that eventually in a couple of months, they will have to invite somebody to join the cell. So the cell grows and has to divide because it became so big. So as I said before, um, these persons being in a cell for a couple of months, they get on fire. So it's not hard for us to tell them, okay, it's time to invite somebody. They already start inviting people before it's time to do so, and we are okay with that. So that's how the, the small group grows, and it's so beautiful to see how they are so comfortable opening up in that small group and sharing everything about their life. And it's so beautiful to see how each person in the group has a talent to help another person that is present there. I think that's, uh, each one of you said in your own way that the best way to grow these groups are for the people themselves to invite others. So I think that's a really important way that one-on-one, -on -one, because people often say to me, well, sister, do you just get the people in the group, in the parish? Well, yeah, I think initially, yes. But then it's to move them to be evangelizers or inviters, whatever kind of language you use, and invite others to be part of that. So I think we have about two or three minutes, maybe, is that? Five minutes, okay. So if anyone has a question, could be for the panel in general. Maybe we could take two questions, and um, if not, I'll ask them a question. But anybody have a question, something on their mind? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I think my experience is many times if there's a person who's a director of mission uh, in the parish or in our part of the world, we talk about directors of faith formation. Um, so I would look with, within the staff that somebody at least could get it started. Now, many times too, if people have time, I mean, we've had great dedicated volunteers. Exactly, my mother was the parish, the renew coordinator in her parish, and in a little pa country parish, she had over 200 people. So, you know, I think it's gotta be a person who has, is organized, and somebody that wants to work with others collaboratively. Because this is not something you can just have one person leading the charge, but the kind of leader that will encourage others. And I think that has a passion for this. I would also say you need a team, and I think each of you have, had, have teams, and not to, I think this is a mistake we made in Renew in the beginning, that same team we wanted to then continue you know, as they went on to ongoing small communities and some people just get tired. So I think you have to change it up, you know, get some new people. I mean, it's always good as you know to have a core that kind of continues. But like any ministry in your parish, to be in changing it up, invite some of those new people that now maybe were involved to be part of the core team. But leadership is just so key, you know, so yes. You mean in terms of family catechesis or? Yeah, I mean, you actually had a small group and you know, we have this program Arise, we have Arise for Youth. So um, you wanna speak to a little bit of that? Oh, I'm sorry. She was saying particularly, I think I have this right, of, of high school students to get them involved Oh, and their parents, okay. You know, I'll speak from as an educator. It's not that easy to have teenagers and parents in the same group. <laughs> have you know? Yeah. But I've had that experience that the teenagers can meet when their parents are meeting. I, I prefer meeting in homes, and I'll tell you why, because I, I find that you'll get more people who are on church to come across the threshold of your front door than you will in the church gathering space. 
So I would say the same thing in terms of, that would be kind of an interesting to have the adults and then teenagers meet two different places. Um, I think that actually would be a good idea. Uh, you know, it's interesting, I've met two people, oh, I think Meg, who works in the Catholic Foundation, when I was saying about, I work in Renew, she's from New Jersey, and she said she remembers her parents meeting and what a witness that was, you know? And she'd be listening, the kids would be listening in. But it was very distinct for her to see her parents and their friends with the Bible open and praying. And this is probably 30 years ago. Hope she's not here, maybe it was only 20 years ago, but. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think there's different, different ways but I do think we need to reach out to those young parents that are still bringing their kids to religious ed. I mean, that's another. You want to speak to the teenage thing? Um, okay, we'll go. Yeah, maybe I can talk about the young adults because when I talk about young people, I mean, we have the young teenagers and young adults. So what happens you find, for example, in the African context, a young people don't, they don't want to discuss some issues in front of their parents. For example, sexuality, all those issues. They need other young people who are going through the same, same, at least they advise one another. You know, sometimes there are things your child goes through and he doesn't want, she, he or she does not want to share with you, but can go to other teenagers. So why we started these young people, small Christian communities, is to help these young people find other young people whom they can build trust and the confidence they can easily share with them. And another thing, when we are talking about how they do their meetings, the young people, maybe in high schools, universities, you find that you know, they have their own time, for example, the weekend for boarding schools. And for day schools, you find young people in your village, you know, they are connected to one another. You know, you can bring in the issues of games, football, uh, basketball, so that these young people come together at the end of the day, they need to share the word of God, share their challenges, and at the same time, they are playing basketball. So that's very, very simple. So I want to encourage you that if you want to know more about young people, small Christian communities, because of time, uh, you can uh, pass by the African table, and you can take our bookmark, you visit our website. And also, we have written a book about young people, small Christian communities. It's coming out on September. Gold Squad, young people on campus. So you can read about what young people in different universities do and how they conduct these young people, small Christian communities, and how they help them. And lastly, we have these beautiful books. We have Building the Church as a Family. You can also look at some of these books. And we have a facilitator's handbook, which can help you know how you are supposed to conduct these small groups of young people and even the church at large. Thank you so much. I will just echo what was said here. We haven't, we haven't cracked that yet, right? We, um, when our young people came for the Lenten series, um, they did identify that they wanted to be separate from parents. And so even when Archbishop Hebda came, they were in a separate room with him. And, and I can't speak to what was said in that room um, because the parents were in another room. And we realized a little too late that it was probably a missed opportunity to um, ha have some time with the parents to talk about things. We, we made our way through, but I think everybody was anticipating that if the Archbishop was there, surely we could all listen in. And, and so I think it's, it's just, again, raises that point that our young people do want to be engaged in, in conversation, but not necessarily with their parents in the room. So it, it's, a, it's a challenge. I would just say, though, that those young people, and I, had that in the parish I worked with, that there needs to be an adult that works with those leaders, you know, because there are issues, as you know, yeah. And not just one, but a team of them that, you know, they're people who have great gifts with, um, with young people. So again, the formation of those young people into, as leaders and supporting them and working and training them takes time and um, resources and it's well, well worth that. So th let's thank the panel so much. I think they did a fabulous job. So thank you all very much. I think I have one, everybody's doing a commercial but me. That's, uh, uh, 
So, um, if you're interested, you know, we have the Arise program uh, and Be My Witness. And anyway, if you have any questions or you just want to talk to me about how to start small groups, I gave you our website there, www.bemywitness.org, and my email. So, I'm happy in any way to help you. So, uh, thank you, and uh, let's go forth and uh, preach the gospel. Thank you.